Well, welcome to another edition of News of the Day, a special feature of Stars, Cells, and God. I'm Hugh Ross, an astrophysicist and the founder of Reasons to Believe. And I'm here to talk about a paper published in Nature Astronomy just a few days ago. This paper here about the discovery of what they call a mature quasar. Now, uh, the research I did at the University of Toronto and Caltech was on quasars in distant galaxies. And the quasars are these huge galaxies that in their cores have these supermassive black holes that radiate highly variable and intense radiation. Uh, a supermassive black hole is defined as any black hole that comes in at a mass greater than one million times the mass of our star, the sun. And uh, what's happened is that in the past few weeks, astronomers using the James Webb Space Telescope have discovered now a total of four uh, cosmic dawn uh, quasars that have supermassive black holes. And this is simply describing the latest one, uh, but what caught the attention of a lot of people, including non-astronomers, is it appears that these supermassive black holes are too big, too fully formed, and occurring too early to fit the Big Bang creation model. Now, the Big Bang creation model was first uh, predicted in the pages of Scripture. It literally goes back thousands of years ago. And you can go to our reasons.org website uh, where I have a paper that I wrote a few months ago showing all the places in the Bible that talks about several of the fundamental features of Big Bang cosmology. So a threat to the Big Bang creation model is actually a threat to the Christian faith. Uh, and so I want to discuss this in the context, not just of the most recent early dawn, uh, cosmic dawn quasar, uh, but the whole list. And so... And it is uh, quite uh, challenging in the sense that these supermassive black holes are not small. They're some of the biggest supermassive black holes we see in the entire universe. And the question is, how can they form that big and that early? Well, let me first give you the data. And uh, the one that's described in this particular paper is the quasar J1120 plus 0641. I mean, you got to love the names that uh, astronomers attach to these quasars. And basically, it's a license plate that tells you the position of the quasar. Uh, but this quasar is so distant, we're seeing it just 760 million years after the cosmic creation event. And uh, the uh, observations with the James Webb Space Telescope were such that they could determine the mass of the supermassive black hole, and it came in at an astonishing 1.52 billion times the mass of our star, the Sun. Now, to give you a point of comparison, the supermassive black hole at the center of our Milky Way galaxy comes in at just 4.15 million times the mass of our star, the Sun. Uh, so we're looking at something uh, that is about 350 times uh, bigger than the supermassive black hole in our galaxy. And our galaxy is considered to be a large galaxy. Uh, so that was shocking. Uh, but another shock was the quasar J1342 plus 0928. And now we're seeing it just 700 million years after the cosmic creation event. So this is significantly earlier. Uh, but the black hole was uh, less massive, still uh, quite large, uh, 0.78 billion times the mass of our star, the sun. So that still ranks. I mean, we define a super, super massive black hole as a black hole that comes in at about a billion times the mass of our star, the sun. Uh, so this is very close to that category. And then a third quasar, J0313 minus 1806. Now we're looking at just 690 million years after the cosmic creation event, and the black hole's mass was determined to be 1.6 billion times the mass of our star, the sun. So these are three quasars, all within, uh, say, around 700 million years after the cosmic creation event, that are supermassive black holes that are coming in the neighborhood of a billion times the mass of the star, the sun. And that's considered to be a fully developed, very mature, uh, supermassive black hole. How can it be that big that early? Well, the most distant supermassive black hole yet detected by astronomers is the uh, quasar noted as GN-Z11. Z11 referring to its redshift. 
And uh, now we're looking at just 410 million years after the cosmic creation event. But here, the supermassive black hole is substantially smaller. Uh, it comes in at just 0 0.002 a billion times the mass of our star of the sun, or in other words, 2 million times the mass of our star of the sun, about half the mass of the supermassive black hole in the center of our galaxy. So this is intriguing. When you're looking at about 700 million years after the cosmic creation event, we're getting supermassive black holes a billion times the mass of our star, the sun. But if you're looking 400 million years after the cosmic creation event, uh, the one that we found so far is coming in not at a billion, uh, but at roughly a million, two million times the mass of our star, the sun. So this has led to some astronomers to speculate uh, maybe these black holes come in on about a million at 400 million years after the cosmic creation event, but rapidly grow to a billion uh, just in the next uh, 300 million years. And to put this in context, the James Webb Space Telescope is telling us that the Big Bang creation models that are best fitting the James Webb observations are where stars begin to form about 200 million years after the cosmic creation event. Incidentally, that's one of the missions of the James Webb to determine uh, the moment when stars first form in the history of the universe, but looks like it's coming in at around 180 to 210 million years after the cosmic creation event. But this still poses a huge problem. How do you get from the first stars just 200 million years after the cosmic creation event to these gigantic supermassive black holes uh, just 500 million years later? Well, astrophysicists have looked at this in the context of the Big Bang creation model and have come up with three scenarios. The one that's most popularly talked about in the scientific literature is that when the universe is young, uh, it's more compressed than it is today, because after all, in Big Bang cosmology, you have the universe continuously expanding. So if you're going back to just a few hundred million years after the cosmic creation event, that means the gas in the universe is much more condensed. And with that more condensed gas, astro astrophysicists are speculating that maybe what's causing the rapid growth in these supermassive black holes is very aggressive accretion of the uh, primordial gas of the uh, universe into these uh, black holes. Uh, and that's, most, that's about the most popular explanation out there. Uh, another one is that uh, there's already evidence, uh, and it's basically coming from observations on this fourth quasar, GNZ11, that the first stars of form in the universe, uh, some of them are much more massive than the most massive stars we see in the universe today. Now, because of the low temperature from the cosmic background radiation that permeates the universe today, and because of all the elements heavier than hydrogen, helium, and lithium, the universe begins according to Big Bang cosmology with just hydrogen in the first four minutes after the cosmic creation event. About a quarter of that hydrogen is fused into a helium, and there's a trace amount of lithium. And so, but once you get stars forming, those stars manufacture carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, iron, all the elements we see in the periodic table. And when the big stars explode, they spray those heavy elements into interstellar space. And it's those heavy elements that prevent very large stars from forming. So the biggest stars that we see in the current universe is about 150 times the mass of our star, the sun. Uh, however, the first stars form where there's only hydrogen and helium and a trace amount of lithium. It also happens when the cosmic background radiation uh, is warmer than it is today. And those two circumstances permit bigger stars to form. And already the James Webb is telling us, based on the observations of this fourth quasar, GNZ11, uh, that the first stars must have a considerable population of stars that weigh in at more than 500 times the mass of our star, the sun, and maybe as much as one, two, even 3,000 times the mass of our star, the sun. And now those are stars that will burn very quickly. I mean, the more massive the star, the faster it burns. In fact, the brightness of a star goes up with a 3.9 power of its mass, 
which means if you've got a star a thousand times more massive than our sun, it will burn a trillion times brighter than our sun. And uh, therefore, it burns up quickly. And uh, when it does burn up, uh, it collapses uh, into a black hole. And the merger of all these black holes from these supermassive stars uh, would be such that you could explain how you can get uh, supermassive black holes that are weighing in at the hundreds of millions, even billions of times the mass of our star the sun. The third scenario that's out there is that, again, with the early universe, uh, you've got the gas much more condensed than it is today, based on the fact that the universe would be smaller in the past. Uh, it's a direct result of the expansion of the universe. As the universe expands, the gas becomes more and more dispersed. So if you're in the early history of the universe, that gas is compressed. And uh, without the heavy elements in that uh, gas, it's actually possible for gas clumps as big as a few 10,000 times the mass of our star, the sun, to begin to collapse under their own gravity. And if you have a gas cloud that's, say, a few, uh, like 30,000 times the mass of our star, the sun, as it collapses, it will collapse and form a black hole without forming a star. Uh, there are theoreticians who have worked out the physics, and that's exactly what happens, is if you get a really massive clump of gas that doesn't have any elements heavier than hydrogen, helium, and a trace amount of lithium, uh, it will actually undergo gravitational collapse, never shine as a star, collapse into a black hole. And now we're talking black holes that are a few times 10,000 times the mass of our star, the sun. You get those merging together, and quickly you get a really massive uh, black hole. Now, the question is, which of these three scenarios, by the way, all three of these scenarios fit the Big Bang creation model. And so the announcement that's been out there in the internet that the discovery of these supermassive black holes is a threat to the Big Bang creation model, that is a myth. Uh, we can get those supermassive black holes quickly by one of these three mechanisms or maybe a combination of these three mechanisms. Now, the question is, what is the explanation for how we get these supermassive black holes so big and so early in the history of the universe? The answer is, we're gonna need to be patient. It'll take the discovery of dozens of more supermassive black holes existing during the first billion years of the history of the universe to tell us which of these three options is the explanation? Is it just one or is it a combination of two or three? Uh, and to what uh, proportion? Uh, so right now, we've only found four. Uh, once we find, say, 30, 40, or 50, uh, the observations should be able to tell us which of these explanations explains how we get these huge black holes that early in the universe. Uh, and actually, uh, the formation of those black holes, the timing of those black holes, it's all part of the fine-tuning argument for why life in the universe is possible today. And uh, also, what's remarkable is our galaxy was fully formed uh, when it was about, uh, well, about 12 to 13 billion years ago. So this raises a question. Why does our big galaxy have such a tiny black hole? Because because we have such a tiny black hole that it's possible for advanced life to exist in the universe. The Milky Way seems to be an exception. I mean, another spiral galaxy the same size as ours, the Andromeda galaxy, its black hole is 35 times bigger than the black hole in our Milky Way galaxy. Now, I wrote about why our black hole is so tiny in my book, Designed to the Core, uh, but these discoveries that are being emerging from the James Webb Space Telescope, I think are gonna give us even more insight. What's so special about our Milky Way galaxy and the fine tuning that we're measuring, how does this testify about the one that created the universe? Bottom line is these discoveries are basically affirming what we've been saying for decades here at Reasons to Believe. The more we learn about the universe, the more evidence we uncover for the supernatural handiwork and design of the universe that makes our existence possible. As always, if you've got comments, put them in. Uh, uh, there's a comment section, and I do read the comments and the response. If you've got any questions or comments, uh, feel, and by all means, uh, do like uh, this video. Thank you.